I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Thank you. you. May be seated. Christ, the one who is our sin bearer, the one who cares for us, the one who cares for us more than anyone else in all the world. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 7. We're looking at that tabernacle of witness. And tonight we are moving into the final piece of furniture in the holy place, directly before the great veil that separated the holy of holies from the holy place. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy and delight it is to once again look at the tabernacle of witness. This tent where you met with your people, which portrayed for them our Lord Jesus Christ. It witnessed to who he was and who he is and who he will be. It witnessed to him as the one who is the eternal I am. It witnessed concerning who he would be as a sacrifice, who he would be as a priest, who he would be as a light, who he would be as the bread of the world. And Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful sacrifices that were there offered on the, the brazen altar, reminding us that you judge sin. The ablutions at the brazen labor, which remind us that you cleanse from sin. Father, how we thank you for your gracious presence with us tonight. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit and for his illuminating work upon your word. We thank you, Father, for our Savior, the one to whom all of this points. We pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week we talked about the table of showbread 
in the tabernacle. And I realized after the sermon last week that we had forgotten, or I had forgotten, not we, I had forgotten to go over the passage in Exodus where the table of showbread uh, is set forth for us. And um, there are quite a number of passages, so we won't read all of them. But God commanded, Thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. And it describes that in Exodus chapter 35 and verses 13 and following about the way in which it was manufactured, the size of the table, the um, arrangement of the various vessels that were used on the table of showbread. The table and his staves, and remember that was carried on the shoulders of priests also, just as were the other articles of furniture. And the showbread. And upon the table of the showbread they spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and the covers to cover with all and the continual bread shall be thereon and they shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet and covering the same with a covering of badger skins and shall put in the staves thereof so we see covering the table of showbread many of the same types of coverings that we saw covering the tabernacle proper going over the entire tent itself and then, of course, we see the historical references, which we did not read before, but we find uh, Abiathar the priest giving the bread to David, uh, which was hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Each day, they would put these loaves of bread on that table fresh before the Lord, because our Lord Jesus Christ is always fresh and the living bread for us. We looked last week, I'll just very quickly cover the multiple ways in which bread is used symbolically in scripture. It was a reminder of the manna in the wilderness, which was in the Ark of the Covenant. It was a reminder that God is the one who provides our daily bread. Our Lord says so in Matthew and Mark and Luke, all three passages. It speaks of Christ who is the bread of life. It speaks of Christ who is the sinless one, the unleavened bread, who would provide himself as the Passover lamb. It speaks of the body of Christ in which he bore our sins on the cross. It reminds us of who Jesus is and what he did. As the two on the road to Emmaus discovered when he broke the bread in their presence, it reminded them of who he is and what he had done. It speaks to us of Christ who is the bread come down from heaven. And of course that passage there in John chapter 6, as we went through it very carefully last week, is a key passage dealing with the issue of salvation. And it is one of the key passages that demonstrates that Rome is wrong in terms of their doctrine of, con of uh, transubstantiation. Because Jesus said that as he spoke to them of himself as the bread and of them partaking of him and eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood, that he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He was not saying that that communion supper, which had not yet been instituted, was actually a changing of the bread and the cup into his actual body and blood. And so it's a very important passage when we're dealing with the issue of salvation and dealing with the issue of the Lord's table. And of course that speaks to us of the body of Christ, that bread, in the memorial of the Lord's table, which was a regular practice in the early church. And we read multiple passages in the book of Acts concerning that. And we saw it connected again with the Passover sacrifice in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 5 where the unleavened bread is connected to the feast of Passover and both of those represent our Lord Jesus Christ as the sinless one. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump even as you are unleavened for Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. We saw that the bread also speaks of the return of Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. It reminds us that our Savior is going to return. And then the one that perhaps um, took some by surprise is that the bread also speaks of believers in the body of Christ. And that is uh, something that parallels very closely what we saw when we looked at the candelabra, the lampstand, the seven-branched menorah, Christ as the light of the world, and he says, you are also lights, likewise we are also bread. We being many are one bread and one body, 
for we are all partakers of that one bread. The bread also speaks to us of how God has provided food for the priesthood, and we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It was holy bread that only the priest could normally eat because it was for those who were sanctified. And we talked about that in some detail when we spoke of the cross and sanctification on Communion Sunday. It speaks both of the living word Christ and of the written word, and it is a reminder that God gives good things to his children. He always provides bread. He doesn't provide us with stones. Uh, he, when we ask a fish, he doesn't provide us with a scorpion. Uh, it's a wonderful knowledge that we have a Heavenly Father who does provide good things for his children. It's a reminder that the hand of God is not shortened in providing for his children as we looked at the, the loaves that were multiplied at the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000. It's a reminder that God has given us bread, that is his word, to provide supernaturally not only for ourselves but also for others as he gave the bread to the disciples and said, you take it and give them to eat. Bread speaks to us of doctrine, either the doctrine of Christ or of the false doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. And then finally we saw that the showbread in particular reminds us of the grain of wheat that is pulverized in the mill of suffering and subject to the fire of divine judgment for sin. Many things that bread is used for symbolically throughout the scriptures. God has given it to us to remind us about our Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us tonight to the altar of incense, another very important article of furniture in the holy place, which also speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his work. And as a result, we discover, as we look at the over 180-some references in the Old Testament in particular, we discover that many of them are the offering of false incentives. In fact, the majority of passages in the Old Testament dealing with incense and with the offering of incense before a god deal with the offering of incense to a false god. Very significant. And we also discover that God on multiple occasions judges people because they have offered incense to false gods. The altar of incense, in summary, it gives us a picture of prayer, the highest form of worship, and the direct access to the presence of God. We're going to see something about the incense that's offered on the altar of incense as it relates to coming behind the veil and covering the holiest place, that gold plate between the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant. When the high priest went in once a year on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, to make atonement for the sins of the people, the smoke of the incense preceded him inside the veil. This is the very last article of furniture before you get to that veil. The book of Hebrews tells us that the veil is a picture of the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. And as he dies on the cross, the veil is rent, making direct access to God. But what is there in front of the veil is the altar of incense, and the incense precedes us into the presence of God. Incense, directly approaching the very presence of God through prayer. The censer being brought with the high priest on Yom Kippur into the Holy of Holies to cover the Ark of the Covenant. Now, as we think about incense, we think often about the wise man. Oh, there was the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Beautiful pictures of these men from the east coming to worship the newborn king, recognizing his kingship with the gold, worshiping him with the frankincense, and the myrrh, which is a picture of his death for our sins. But as we move through the Old Testament, it is very clear, and then we get into the New Testament and see the same thing, that this is a picture of prayer. David says in Psalm 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. But that picture also takes us all the way to the book of Revelation, the final, the final book in the New Testament, 
where we see in two different verses another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and this is the altar of incense this is directly before the presence of God having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne the golden altar takes you back to the tabernacle the incense takes you back to the tabernacle you know precisely which article of furniture we're dealing with here because there was only one golden altar that was connected to incense and it says not merely before the Ark of the Covenant it says which was before the throne you recall that the Shekinah glory when it rested upon that goat hair tent rested over the Holy of Holies it showed that God was dwelling in the midst of his people and we've spoken about that in John chapter 1 and verse 14 where the word was made flesh and dwelt among us pitched his tent skene, and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth the altar of incense is before that Ark of the Covenant where the blood was shed and the sins of the people were covered for another year but now that has taken place already and now as we move to the book of Revelation it's move it's it's pictured for us not as the the place where the bleeding sacrifice is it's pictured for us as a throne a golden throne surrounded by cherubim upon which our Lord Jesus Christ is seated as we move into the book of Revelation the angel stood before the altar he has the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne and then in verse 4 the next verse and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angels hand and the one whom we see seated upon the throne in the book of Revelation the one who is foreshadowed as sitting upon the throne in Daniel chapter 7 Daniel chapter 9 and in the book of Ezekiel is our Lord Jesus Christ he is the throne sitter he is the one who is indeed the sovereign king the blood has been shed upon the hilasterion upon the mercy seat and now that golden mercy seat has become the throne from which the king of the Shekinah glory reigns magnificent and beautiful picture that is given to us here in these two verses now we find the description of the altar of incense and the special spices that are offered on it over in the book of Exodus we find mention of it in chapter 25 the oil for the light the spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense Moses is told that special spices are supposed to be gathered together and compounded for the incense that will be made upon this altar rather interesting also God gives some very very specific instructions about the incense and about who may offer it he also gives some special instructions about how it will be compounded and who may compound it and some restrictions against others who would want to imitate it you see the altar of incense is speaking to us of our Lord Jesus Christ and the incense that's offered on it speaks of his intercession for us and there is no one who unauthorized can come behind the veil into the presence of God other than through the prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ we find that very clearly stated for us over in two places first we find in Romans chapter 8 we find that a marvelous passage and I wish we could spend a lot of time here but that that intercession that prayer that comes before the throne of God is offered by the Spirit of God and by our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 26 it says likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered you and I are very feeble in the way in which we pray even the most eloquent man that has ever lived has prayed very feeble prayers there needs to be a supernatural intercession on our behalf 
And the Holy Spirit is the first one that makes that intercession for us, as we see here in verse 26. But it is also our Lord Jesus Christ who intercedes for us. We get down to verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. The book of Hebrews portrays him as our great high priest. It portrays him as the one who is interceding for us. He is the one who moves through the tabernacle in that gorgeous picture that God has given to us, offering incense there upon the altar, and then on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, taking the censer of incense and going behind the veil, and there sprinkling his blood upon the mercy seat. And then we see the angel offering incense in Revelation, for Christ is then seated upon that throne, which was the mercy seat. We find this is also stated for us over in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 7, and down in verse 25. And this is in the context of the tabernacle and of the work of the priests in the tabernacle. We'll start reading back in verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, speaking of Jesus, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Takes you back to the book of Genesis and where Melchizedek came out and met Abraham. And Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek and Melchizedek gave him bread and wine, which foreshadows for us our Lord Jesus Christ. But Melchizedek is a theophany. If you read carefully Hebrews chapter 7 and the references in chapter 5 and chapter 6, it is a theophany. That is an appearance of Christ prior to the incarnation. Melchizedek, who met Abraham, and Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see me. He saw me and was glad. There is much connection between the Old Testament and the New. And so here we find this priesthood. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were made many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. We're at the altar of incense here. Our Lord Jesus Christ, as we come to God, is the one who makes intercession for us so that we can come into the very presence of God himself. The veil has been rent, but what precedes us is the interceding work of the Spirit of God and the interceding work of our Lord Jesus Christ. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as though high priest, those high priests who offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ as we move through the tabernacle here, making intercession for us. It describes in Exodus chapter 30 the way in which the altar of incense was built. Rather interesting, this is not a large altar as the brazen altar was it's quite a small altar thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood shalt thou make it a cubit shall be the length thereof and a cubit the breadth thereof four square it shall be and two cubits shall be the height thereof the horns thereof shall be of the same 18 inches wide 18 inches deep 36 inches tall, three feet tall. You know, I think we often think of the altar of incense as bigger than that. This was a very small article of furniture where the high priests offered their incense. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. So you have this gold-covered box 
And on the top edge, you've got a beautiful crown of gold, and at each corner, there is a horn that comes off from this altar. And then there are rings where they place the staves. Two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, thou shalt make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. So it wasn't along the sides, it was at the corners. So as the, the altar of incense was being carried by the priests, it was in a diamond shape as you move forward. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Where I... God is speaking, will meet with thee. What a tremendous privilege we have when we come to God in prayer. Are you cognizant of the fact that when you pray, you are having a meeting with God? And we take it so lightly. He has set aside that time for us to come into his presence. If you were going to have a meeting with the President of the United States, whether you like him or not, you would get yourself ready for it. If you were going to have a meeting with the governor of the state of New Jersey, you would get yourself ready for it. If you were even going to have a meeting with the president of a company to which you were applying for a job, you would get prepared for it. You would come in your very best. You would seek to speak courteously and graciously. You would seek to say those things that you know are pleasing to the one with whom you are interviewing. What a privilege it is to come into the very presence of God for a personal meeting with him. What a privilege it is because you are his child. You can come directly to him any time of day or night, and he always has time for you. Dear friends, how often do we abuse that? How often is he ready for meeting with us, but we're too busy with doing something else? Oh, we normally have our quiet time in the morning or in the evening or perhaps throughout the day sometime. But other things of life push in. Other things suddenly become more important and more pressing to us. As Dawson Trotman wrote the little book, The Tyranny of the Urgent, presses out that which is most necessary. We come to him for fellowship in prayer. We come to him to give us understanding and light upon his word, which is his instruction book for our day. We come to him with our sorrows and with our griefs and our petitions. But we should also be coming to him with our praises and with our thanksgiving and with words that bring him glory and honor. The altar of incense and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit taking our words there and bringing them into the heavenly throne room. That is your privilege, that is my privilege. How much time do you want to spend in the presence of the living God? Our Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest who brings our petitions before the throne. 
He's the one who takes us there. Magnificent picture is given to us here. It says, you shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. You will never go there and find that he is late for the appointment. You will never go there and find out that he has canceled you out because he had something more important to do. I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. This is a daily activity. This is not merely an activity that takes place sporadically when Aaron felt like it. Every morning he trimmed the lamps. Every evening he lighted the lamps. Every morning he burns sweet incense. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Every evening that incense went up before the veil that concealed the Ark of the Covenant. Morning and evening. Some of you are familiar with Spurgeon's morning and evening. It's a picture that's given to us of our continual access to God because it says he shall burn incense upon it a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations but there's another warning that's given to us in the very next verse ye shall offer no strange incense thereon the only kind of incense permitted on the golden altar of incense was a specific incense compound that God himself prescribed. That tells us something about the types of prayers that we can bring when we come into his presence. If you are praying carnal prayers, you are offering strange incense. If you are praying prayers to the wrong God, you're offering strange incense. If you are not prepared, as we'll see in a moment, from those who were not prepared, what happened to them, you will come under God's judgment when you try to come into his presence. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, and you couldn't offer other things on the altar of incense. Incense alone could be offered there because he says, nor bird sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. God was very, very specific about what could be offered at the altar of incense. But there was something that happened once a year. They reminded us, of, reminded us of what took place in the outer court. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And it goes on and describes how Aaron would take of the blood of the sacrifice in that outer courtyard and he would bring of it on his fingertips and would sprinkle it upon the horns of the golden altar of incense. The reason that we have access into the presence of God through our prayer is because of the blood of the sacrifice, our Lord Jesus Christ, which was killed on Calvary's cross. We discover in Exodus chapter 30 also some very important things about the incense that could be offered and the oil that was used in the lamps. In beginning in verse 22, Moreover the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou take thou also unto thee three principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels. 
and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil and hin. Thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith and the ark of the testimony and the table and all of his vessels and the candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the labor and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. All the furniture was prepared, and all those who would minister were prepared before they could come in and do any of the work. But he goes on, <clears throat> Thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, then consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, <clears throat> This shall be an holy anointing oil unto you throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. And whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any upon a stranger, shall be cut off from his people. There were only certain ones who could be prepared for what is to take place next. Only certain articles of furniture which had been prepared with the holy anointing oil could be used in this form of worship. We're going to see that there are many altars of incense throughout the Old Testament. We probably don't have time to look at all the passages, 121 of them. Uh, that's an awful lot of places where the people of Israel disobeyed what God is giving Moses here. Wrong altars, wrong incense, wrong preparation, wrong priests. And they came under judgment of God for doing it. But then he goes on. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, Stakti, and Ankya, and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each there shall be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection, after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make it to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereof, even he shall be cut off from his people. This was the incense that was put on the altar of incense before the tabernacle, before the veil of the tabernacle in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody could duplicate it. It was a holy compound. No one could use it to smell it. A beautiful smell. But it was holy unto the Lord. Again, we find that description in Exodus chapter 37, verses 25 through 29. It talks about the Ark of the Covenant, excuse me, the uh, altar of incense, how it was made, how large it was. Moses makes those things and it says he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of the sweet spices according to the work of the apothecary. And then of course once the year the blood put on the horns of the altar. Now we get a little farther and we find some people who decide that they want to do it and they want to take the authority upon themselves without being prepared and without being called to do it. They're in the right line, but they have not been called and commissioned to do this. Leviticus 10, beginning in verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, 
which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. His two oldest sons have just been burned to a crisp by a fire that comes out from God. They dared, they dared to try to offer incense and strange fire which God had not commanded before the Lord, and he killed them. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphon, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp. And Moses said, as Moses had said, And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, these are the next number three and number four, the sons of Aaron, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. They were not even allowed to mourn. Nadab and Abihu. Moses warns them severely. You can't even mourn for them because they have, they have transgressed the commandments of the Lord. They have offered strange fire and incense before the Lord. Now that would seem kind of painful, wouldn't it? Not even to be allowed to mourn them. No, can't mourn them. Because that would show that you pitied them. That you thought what the Lord did with them was wrong. Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. They had to get some other relatives to carry the bodies outside the camp. They weren't even allowed outside the tabernacle because that holy anointing oil which had prepared them for the service of the Lord was upon them. God takes his worship very seriously. God takes who does what very seriously. He's placed various restrictions on leadership in worship as you move into the New Testament, and yet many people are offering strange fire upon the altar. Many people are not prepared. Many people are not called. Many people are not consecrated. Many people violate the principles that God has set down in his word concerning who should preach and who should not. And there are many women who are violating that in so-called evangelical and charismatic churches today. It's serious business when we come before the Lord. This is coming up to the very presence of God right before the veil where you enter in once a year as the high priest or where Christ enters in once a year as the high priest. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation lest ye die for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron saying, now God has been talking to Moses, now he turns to Aaron who is the high priest. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. The priesthood pictures for us believers. We are a royal priesthood. God placed a prohibition on them whenever they were ministering to the Lord that they must not drink wine or strong drink, either the lightweight beverage or the heavy-duty beverage. We are in God's presence continually. We are ministering to him continually. I wish we had time to talk about wine in the Bible tonight. Maybe one of these days I'll give you a full message on that. But you as a believer should never touch fermented alcoholic beverages. Never, ever. It is not your right to drink. You are a holy priest unto the Lord. You have been called to his service. 
It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that ye may put a difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. That was the picture of what was holy and that was the picture of what was unholy. That's why they were not to do it. Holiness and cleanness. And that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. What you are to be filled with is not wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. A little wine, a little bit of control that turns you the wrong way. A lot of wine, a lot of control. It functions in such a way as to control your mind and your speech and your body when you are under the control of wine or alcoholic beverages. But you are to be filled not with wine, but with the Spirit of God. And then He controls the way you think. Then He controls the way you speak. Then He controls the way you act. And not that which makes you into a fool. That ye may teach the children of Israel. That's why you don't drink, he says. All the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. I know pastors who think it's their perfect right to drink. And they do. How then will they teach the people of God the statutes of God? Verse 12, And Moses spake unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar, his sons that were left, Take the meat offering that remaineth of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. Interesting. They were to eat of the bread beside the altar of incense, which is what we're talking about here. It's the same context of Nadab and Abihu. It's the way the passage ends. They were to eat of the unleavened bread. They had been consecrated. The oil of consecration was upon them. What a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in both cases. Then we find on Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement, which he has mentioned in passing before. Leviticus chapter 16, beginning in verse 12. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. He takes the coals off that altar of incense, and puts them in the censer and he has a handful of incense and as he goes in before the Lord he sprinkles the incense on the coals that he carries inside the veil on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, once a year. What a picture of the prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ preceding us as he goes into the presence of the Father on our behalf. And to the office of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest pertaineth the oil for the light and the sweet incense and the daily meat offering and the anointing oil and the oversight of all the tabernacle and all that therein is in the sanctuary and in the vessels thereof. God bypassed the two who tried to get ahead of it. Tried to get ahead of the game. God chose Eleazar after the first two sons were killed. We find again another very interesting passage of others who decided they wanted to usurp authority which did not belong to them. It's the story of Korah and Dathan in Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. And they arose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. In other words, these are important people. These are people who think that because they're important, therefore they should be allowed to do certain things that they have not yet been allowed to do. 250 of them, princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, 
And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now you know there's an interesting mixture of truth and error in what they say. Was this a holy congregation? Yes, God had set them apart for himself. Was this the congregation of the Lord? Yes, that is true. Was the Lord among them? Yes, that is true. But their accusation is you've taken upon yourselves to restrict certain offices and certain activities within the congregation. And that was not true. It was God who had appointed them. And Moses heard it and fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take you censers, Korah, that is these little dishes, in which the coals were held and upon which the incense would be sprinkled. Take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. They were in the right tribe. They were generally in the right family. But these were not the ones who had been appointed to do this work. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? You've already got great privilege because you're of the sons of Levi. To bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And ye seek the priesthood also. You want to be, move from being a Levitical priest to being an Aaronic priest? There was a job that the Levitical priest did. There's a job that the Aaronic priests did. For which cause both you and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? In other words, when you complain about God's order of things, you're not murmuring about the intermediary. You're murmuring about the wisdom of God and what he has chosen to do. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? That's what they're accusing Moses of. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Oh, how much they forgot about the fact that it's their murmurings that causes them to wander in the wilderness. It's their rebellion against the Lord that God had said, I will not bring you into the land, but you will die in the wilderness. You think we're blind? We can see we're still in the wilderness. You didn't bring us into the land of milk and honey. Against whom are they complaining? Is it not God himself? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. And take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord. Every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. In other words, these were rebels who had their act together. They had already gone and talked to everybody in all the tribes. These were the famous men. These were the men of renown. These were the power brokers. These were the guys that controlled major sections of the children of Israel. And they said, okay, come together. We're going to have a showdown tomorrow. And all the congregation showed up. They wanted to see how the vote would go. There was power politics involved here. Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. God was ready to kill the followers as well as the leaders. 
These were people who had a spirit of rebellion. They were following the wrong leaders. God was ready to kill them all. But Moses, incredible man, how often he prayed for those people that God wouldn't kill all of them. God was ready on several occasions to kill them all. And Moses begged him not to. They fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and that wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and all the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. We're starting out with the guys who refused to come. He said, You're not going to boss us around. You're not going to tell us what to do. We'll do what we want to do, and we'll do it in our own good time. And you can't do anything about it. So God says, All right, go down to their tents. And then Moses... And the elders of Israel go, and he spake unto the congregation, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind, which is what they had accused him of. Then he makes an announcement to the congregation. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. He's about to pull a trigger here. He's about to give a test that will prove whether or not God has called him. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came a fire from the Lord. God's not through here. The first rebels to go, the ones that should have learned the lesson, but they were too haughty and too proud. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up alive and everything that they had. God killed them all. And then listen to what happens next. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how much influence you have. Doesn't matter how much money you have. The issue is, are you one whom God has called, ordained, sanctified, and set apart and prepared for his service? The ones, the 250, they thought that they were something. They were going to lead the congregation in rebellion against Moses. The fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. And the censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make broad plates for a covering for the altar. For they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed. They shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. We're going to make a covering out of these. Take those brazen censers. Scatter the fire. Beat the censers together and make a covering for the altar to remind the children of Israel what I did to someone who tried to offer strange fire and incense before me without being called to do so. God is serious about his worship. And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they that had burnt, had offered, and they that were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand 
of Moses. 24 hours go by. Did the people learn their lesson? Did they understand what God was trying to teach them? Listen to the very next verse. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. We don't know how you do it. That was a pretty good trick, you know, making the earth split open and swallowing up those guys and then making this fire come zooming out and burning up 250 guys and being quite selective about it, you know. Uh, we don't know how you did that, but you are the ones who did it. You have killed the people of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. Those were the rebel leaders. And God is the one who killed them. And they knew that it was going to be a test as to whom God would accept in the offering of the incense. But the people don't get it. Dear friends, how often do we miss the point that God is trying to make with us? How often do we walk in the ways of wickedness and then have God do something to us and then blame somebody else for it? Or complain about what God has done? We are the ones who have sinned. Certainly if we come with the wrong incense, the wrong censers, without the preparation of the holy anointing oil, which speaks of the Holy Spirit of God, we're going to find ourselves in serious difficulty when we come bringing carnal prayers before God's throne of grace. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, but they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord appeared, and Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. This is 24 hours after Moses has just prayed that God won't kill that congregation. And they may have wondered, maybe we should have let him kill them yesterday. But they don't. They pray for them again. They fell upon their faces, and Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar. Here we're back to the altar of incense again. And put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. As they're getting up, people are dropping dead. And Moses says, Quick, get a censer. You're the one who's authorized to do this. Take the fire, take the incense, put it on. Run into the camp. Get ahead of the plague which God is knocking them down one after another, after another, after another. Get between them and the living. Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. Behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. The book of James talks about a sin unto death. It talks about praying for those who are sick and them recovering. But it also talks about how he shouldn't pray for those who have sinned a sin unto death. Very interesting. It's like Aaron with the incense, which gives to us the picture of the prayers of the saints standing between the dead and the living making intercession for them. Though they were about to kill him, he was the one whom God used to stop the plague so that it wouldn't spread any further. The incense spread out and was almost as though it were a barricade as the people were falling in front of him and the other people were behind him. They died up to that line and behind him they lived. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. Tells us that that was about 15,000 people when you consider the 250 and when you consider Korah and those other rebels and their families who were swallowed up by the earth. Do you think God is serious? about the way in which we are to approach him? I think he is. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
and the plague was stayed. There is a very serious danger when leaders do wrong. And I'm only going to give you a couple of illustrations because our time has already passed. But here we find Solomon and incense in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon is a mixed bag. There is much in the life of Solomon that is good. We remember his prayer for wisdom. But there is much in the life of Solomon that is compromised because he had, in addition to wisdom, given to him all these other things for which he did not ask. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Solomon loved the Lord. It says so. Walking in the statutes of David his father. David, a man after God's own heart, David, the one who prepared for the temple, and Solomon, the man who built it. But listen to the next phrase. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. Was he really only offering incense to the true God? We discover in chapter 11 the answer is no. Likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. What kind of example was he setting for the people? I didn't write them all down, but I mean, there are dozens of passages where it tells us after Solomon, the people continued to sacrifice in the high places and offer incense in the high places. Where did they get that idea? Solomon decided to do some of the things that the pagan nations around him was doing. Hey, if it's okay for Solomon, and he loves the Lord, it must be okay for us. I was talking to a man recently who was saying, well, um, you know, I know some young men uh, who are pastors, and they say it's okay to have tattoos, and they themselves are getting tattoos so that they can fit in with our culture and minister in our culture. What does that tell their congregations that it's okay to do? Remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whoever defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit, him will God destroy. There's so many different applications that we could make of this. But dear friends, Solomon set the example and the children of Israel followed it for generation after generation after generation after generation and it became a plague in Israel. Jeroboam and his false worship. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 33. So he offered upon the altar which he had made at Bethel the 15th day of the 8th month, even unto the month which he had devised in his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. He offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord. This is this man of God who has come out of Judah and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Prophesied the name even. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. The men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And you know how Jeroboam's hand is withered, the altar is split, and then the man of God disobeys God and doesn't go all the way home, and there's an old priest who's a compromiser, and he gets him to eat, and then the compromiser, who is a prophet of God, also stands up and says, you didn't obey God, so you're going to get killed on your way home. And a lion kills him, and the donkey stands there next to him. A man who had just proclaimed the truth. against Jeroboam who had offered incense on a false altar to a false god on a day that he'd made up in his own heart. We find down in chapter 22, verse 43, just a few. He walked in the ways of Asa his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. 
We get over to 2 Kings chapter 12. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. Chapter 14, albeit the high places were not taken away. We're going king after king. I'm just giving you the verses that relate to each of these kings. The high places were not taken away, yet as yet the people did sacrifice and burn incense in the high places. Chapter 15, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. Verse 35, end of the chapter. Howbeit the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Chapter 16, and he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. It gets worse and gets worse and it gets worse. Solomon set the wrong example, didn't he? Chapter 17, and there they burned incense in all the high places as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. They're not just burning incense, now they're getting involved in the pagan orgies that went along with the high places. We come to Hezekiah. We see some great revival and some great things taking place in his days. He removed the high places. He broke the images, cut down the groves, break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan, which means a worthless thing. You see, they began to take the things that God had used in the past, and those became like relics. As you see in the Catholic Church, the bones of Peter and the nails of the cross and the splinter of the true cross and a veil stained with blood and all those kinds of things. And they began to worship it. The brazen serpent that Moses lifted in the wilderness it was a picture of Christ. Instead of worshiping the living God, they were worshiping a piece of brass. And Hezekiah destroyed it. We find God speaking, because they have forsaken me, they've burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. God does not appreciate it when we worship him in a way which he has not ordained. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. They're giving worship and honor and praying to Baal and the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. They're moving from the worship of the true God into astrology. If you're with us on Wednesday evening, we're talking right now about those who are claiming to be the ones who seeded us here on this planet, the so-called aliens, which is leading into the cultic movement that will ultimately make the way plain for the Antichrist. Dear people, be very careful. You may be moving in, if you don't, careful, and if you're listening to people who have this kind of stuff, moving into what is very parallel to the worshiping of false gods with incense which speaks to us not only of prayer, but in particular of the one who is our great high priest, who prays for us, makes intercession for us, between us and God the Father. He brought all the priests of the cities of Judah, defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba, and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. We get over to First Chronicles. Aaron and his sons offered upon the altar of the burnt offering and the altar of incense and were appointed for all the work of the place most holy and to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, a servant of God, commanded. What a difference between that which had gone rampant wild in terms of wickedness and what God had ordained. The sons of Amram, Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless his holy name forever. We could spend time looking at Solomon. I have verses down there, and the incense that was offered, and bowing down before false gods. We come to the days of Uzziah. Oh, wow, God judged Uzziah for his usurpation of that which had not been given to him. 
When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And they, that is the priests, withstood Uzziah the king. He's king. Hey, can't the king do whatever he wants? No, not if God said no. They withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto the Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. He's there almost ready to do it. They're withstanding him, saying, get out right now. He gets mad and as his face flushes, leprosy breaks out all over his face. And they grab him. He's the king, remember. They grab him and they thrust him out of the house of the Lord. And all the rest of his life he had to live in a separate house by himself because he was not one who had been ordained to offer incense. You see, he was breaking a type. He was breaking a picture of the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. How deadly it is when we violate the pictures that God has given to us and what does it cost? Dear friends, we could talk a lot about the various pictures that have been violated. The marriage bond, when adultery is committed, that, for example, violates the picture between Christ and his bride, the church. There are very many sins that break pictures that God has given to us in the Old Testament. Here's one of them. Coming unprepared into the presence of the Lord without your great high priest who goes before you with the incense which comes before the veil and inside the veil with the prayers of the saints. We see the various commands to the priests. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. We see false worship in the house of God. There are so many passages in Jeremiah we can't... I mean, he mentions the altar of incense over and 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 over again. Talking about the incense that's being offered to the false gods and how he condemns, God condemns through Jeremiah the prophet, the house of Israel, because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor his statutes, nor his testimonies. Therefore, this evil has happened unto you as this day. We find it both of men and women. And we find it very parallel to what's going on in Rome today with all their censers and their incense which they swing around in their buildings and offering it to Mary and to the saints. Listen to what the problem was with the women. Jeremiah 44, beginning in verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. We and our fathers are kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. But then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. In other words, hey, it worked before. And since we stopped doing it, hey, it hasn't been so good. So now we're going to go ahead and do it again. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Hey, we're not the only ones to blame here, Jeremiah. The men went along with us in this. Here's the men. Moving down to verse 25, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Burning incense to the Queen of Heaven, it still goes on in Rome today and in Roman Catholic organizational buildings all over the world. And they think it's doing them good. It's condemned in the book of Jeremiah. In Ezekiel, there stood up before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood up Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, and every man with his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. 
the false worship that Ezekiel sees. And then, of course, we move to the New Testament. We see someone who is in the Aaronic line. We see someone who is able and qualified and prepared, now suddenly having his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because there are so many descendants now of Aaron that they have to cast lots as to who will get to offer the incense. According to the custom of the priest's office, this is Zacharias. His lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. You see, the incense preceded and went with the prayers of the saints. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And you know the rest of the story, how God tells him that his wife Elizabeth is going to bear a son who will be the one we know as John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who prepares the way in the wilderness, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John prepares the way for Jesus. And of course, now we have direct access to the Father through prayer and with our Lord Jesus Christ as our great high priest, making intercession for us because of the blood of Christ. It was prophesied in the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. You see, the tabernacle and temple have been fulfilled. We now have direct access to the Father for the veil has been rent in twain. And now the gospel of Christ, as we see in the book of Acts, has reached throughout the world. And the prayers of the saints don't merely ascend at Jerusalem. But in every place, my name shall be great among the heathen. In every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. Back to where we started. What a privilege we have when we come to meet with God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for the rich and blessed privilege of coming into your presence. Father, as we move through the tabernacle, there had to be a sacrifice for our sins. There had to be a cleansing, the confession of sin, as we move closer. We had to be walking in the light. We had to be partaking of the bread of life before we come to the altar of incense. For the cloud of the sweet incense, the only kind of incense that you would accept, with the only fire that burned the incense off of that altar, preceding us, through the veil by our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever lives to make intercession for us as we come into the very throne room of God. We come to our King, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Father, for this picture. And thank you, Father, that you gave it to the Jews that they might understand Christ the one whom they rejected, the only one who could save them. Father, we pray that you will help us as we come into your presence, always to come with clean hands and a pure heart, with the anointing oil of your spirit, with the blood sprinkled upon the altars, even of the horns of incense. And then as we come before you, know that you, as our Father, delight to receive us at any time, day or night, because you are our Father, and we may call you Abba. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our great High Priest, in whose name we pray. Amen.